Wonderful people. Um, today we just want to allow the Spirit of God to move. And the vessel that he has chosen will be coming up right now. And I just want to introduce the vessel that God is using to minister to us today. And this is his bio. He was a young man with a promising career. All he wanted was to be one rich pharmacist. Then he met a pastor who saw beyond his worldly dream and challenged him. While he thought about it, the girl he was eyeing to marry said yes to the call. And when the pastor came around again, it was a no-brainer. Of course he said yes. As a result of that, one, um, as a result of that one yes, many years ago, fast forward to today, one movement, five networks, six networks, one movement, six networks, so many campuses. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome with me, the one and only husband to one, Carol, father to three young world changers, and many other poxers by adoption. He is none other than Pastor Murray the Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Pastor CJ. Amen. My goodness. Can I travel with you whenever I travel anyway? You just, you just introduce me like that. <laughs> wow. Is God in the house? Can you sense it? I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit right now to just impart on you. Make sure you're getting the impartation. Lord, I want impartation this morning. Come on, it's not just knowledge I want, Lord. I'm here for impartation. I want to catch the Spirit. There's a word you have for me, Lord. While on others you're calling, don't pass me by. This is what we are asking the Lord right now. Lord, Holy Spirit, rain down on us. We've asked you already, but we know you're here. Now we're saying, Lord, give us your impartation. While on others you're calling, don't pass any one of us by. Whether we are online, whether we're here in person, we pray that, Lord, you would just fall down. Let your glory rest upon this place. And Lord, I pray that we would catch everything you want us to catch. We love you, Jesus. We declare that we love you, Jesus. We're unashamed that we love you, Jesus. This is your house, Lord. Come and do what you want. For we ask this in Jesus' name. God's people say it together. Amen. amen. Amen and amen. Wow. Oh, my goodness. It's such a joy to be here. And um, as I begin, I've been, I've been uh, I want to call my favorite testimony pastor, uh, Pastor Godwin. Uh, <laughs> this man always has a testimony. Uh, by the way, this year, I'm declaring there will be testimonies in your campus every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pastor Godwin is just modeling for us. Looking for, you need to hunt for testimonies because God is doing something all the time. God is always at work. So it's our job to catch what God is doing. And I think one of the things I've loved about Pastor God is every day when he's out, he's always looking for what testimonies are happening. And then he tells me, I got, I got a testimony. So uh, you're going to introduce the person that is going to be sharing the testimony that you caught. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you, Pastor M. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Pastor Godi. So, yeah, so this week, Pastor M taught us through Matthew chapter 10 at some point. I think it was day one. And he talked about how Jesus sent his disciples and the disciples were sent and commissioned to go out to preach and to heal the sick and to, you know, perform miracles, to cast out demons and all that. And so there's one of us here who caught that word and said, I'm going to do it That's right. uh, practically. And so I just want to invite her and for her to just come and share with us how practically she made that happen. Uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Nyamurwa. Come on, Nyamuru Matogo. Come on, Nyamu. Nyamu. Pastor Nyamu. Pastor, the one who has actually made all this happen because Woo. of, uh, you know, let's celebrate her because she has actually helped us in this entire gathering to see to it that we have a successful gathering. Come on, Pastor hey. Nyamu. Come on, give, give us some round of applause, oh, some oh, more. Oh, oh. <laughs> Morning, Mavuno. Morning. Uh, thank you, Pastor Time. Thank you, Pastor Godwin. Uh, so on Thursday, I've been staying at Great Wall at my friend's house. And as I was there, she was sharing with me that her son, who's about the same age as my son, has been having asthma attacks at night. So when we were here on Thursday, I, you know, there was so many stories of healing and so many testimonies. So I told myself, you know what, today we'll go and we'll pray for him. 
And I texted and I told her, you know, today we'll come and we'll pray for him and he'll be healed. He will no longer have asthma attacks. So in the evening, uh, the gathering <laughs> wait, ended, wait. I so went. So you, you said it in the middle of a teaching. You texted her yeah, and I told her, him. tonight yes. we're going to pray yes. and asthma attacks are over. Yes. <laughs> Somebody say, Biazo. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so in the evening, we went. Uh, then we were chilling, hanging out. Then as he was about to go to bed, uh, I, I took him in my arms and I said, let's pray. It wasn't even a complicated prayer. I just told God, heal this baby. We, I held on to his chest and I just said, asthma attacks be gone in Jesus' name. Amen. And we believed. And he has not had an asthma attack since Thursday. He didn't have one yesterday. Thursday night, he didn't have one Thursday. Oh, come yesterday on. Night, and we won't have them in the name of oh, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Somebody say, wow. She texted and said, your son will not have asthma attacks. We're going to pray tonight. Come on, guys. This is boldness, huh? We're not hearing. This is not word. The word is not for our notebooks. The word is for our hearts. We're here for impartation, not just to hear a word. And so take it boldly. I think this is what God, God told us. Preach the kingdom, heal the sick. That's what he told us. So you're not doing it because you, you, you like healing. You're doing it because it's a command. God told me to do it, so I pray and I believe it. Amen? Wow, 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 wow. Come on, somebody give another big applause to Nyamo. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, I know that's not the only testimony. I know there are others, people who've been sharing testimonies about how you've been, you've been laying hands and just trusting God for healing. And I'm excited. I can't wait to hear. So please let us hear those testimonies. Let's share them. Uh, let's give glory to God. Because it's not Nyamo who healed, it's God who healed. All she did was she was obedient. Uh, amen. So I'm going to talk a bit about... Um, this morning, uh, I love how uh, Pastor CJ said it's a surprise. Uh, it's also been a surprise for me. Uh, there are times I've come here with a word, and then I just feel God leading me in a funny direction. And so even the guys at the PA where I sent my notes are like, that's not what you sent us. And I'm like, yeah, I sat down, prepared. I just sat down, and I started getting a download, and it's completely different from what I sent you guys. So I really believe that the Lord has a word today. Uh, and he wanted me to talk about serving God bivocationally. Mm. Serving God bivocationally. Now, you don't have to be a pastor or a missionary or a paid evangelist to be a servant of God. You don't. Um, you don't. You, can't, you, you, you just need to be available. I love how Nyamo was available. By the way, some, one of the things that causes us not to pray for the sick is because we think, what if I pray and nothing happens? I'll get embarrassed. Anybody feel like that? Or God might get embarrassed. Oh my God, who am I to, de to defend God? <laughs> you know? So, so when somebody asks that question, this, I, I, this is aside from my notes, when somebody asks me that question, what I say is, listen, what I've learned is, you pray, let God do his part. Pray by faith, because God told you to pray. And then, one of the things I've learned to do now is, I pray, and I believe God for a miracle, and then I say, when we next see each other, if it's a church, I tell them, on Sunday next week, let's show, show up, come, come and let's talk about, where, how, let's see what God has done. And I come with faith that something has happened. And if the person tells me, okay, the headache is no longer all around my head, it's just on this side, I'm like, God has healed that part. Amen. Now let's pray for the remaining part. And we just keep praying and keep praying until it happens. So we don't quit. We don't quit when nothing happens the first time. We just keep pushing. And sometimes what happens, there are many reasons. Perhaps God wants to build my faith. <laughs> Perhaps God wants to build this person's faith. Perhaps they're demonic forces that have taken a long time to entrench themselves and they just need to be battered until they... I don't know. God just has a way He does things. Other times it's instantaneous. I remember one person that um, got healed. I always tell this story about one lady who was in my first Mizizi class who just in class, even before anybody prayed for her, she just got delivered of a smoking addiction that had lasted many years. Just like that. It was just boom and it went. And she, she had been a chain smoker, like a chain smoker for a long time. And then another lady who was uh, at the church at the same time and she struggled, and she re really wondered, why is it that I'm not being healed? And we prayed and prayed, and she would come and tell me, okay, I'm no longer smoking three packets, now I'm down to six cigarettes. And it's like, okay, let's pray. <laughs> and we just kept praying. And you know, God was working very differently in those two ladies. In the second lady, God did something very powerful in her life, because God ended up giving her a powerful ministry that has helped deliver many people from addiction, many people in the workplace from addiction. And she calls herself an apostle to the marketplace. I'm talking about Pastor Angie Moringa. Uh, some of you know her. Um, and that's how God, isn't that powerful? Like God was birthing a ministry and that's why he didn't cure her immediately. 
He wanted her to have the empathy. Because if she was healed immediately, she, was work, she works with addicts, she works with people who are in the workplace, who are alcoholics. And so it's almost like she needed to understand the pain and be patient, and the patience she needs to work with people. So it's not my business to tell God how to heal. My business is to obey Him and pray. Amen. So even if you're sick here in the house today, trust me, today we're going to pray. And we're going to trust God for deliverance and for miracles. In this house, today. Somebody say, this is my day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have somebody who needs to be here and they're sick, because they're not here because they're sick, tell them, this is actually where you should be. <laughs> you know, this is where you should be. We've seen already some incredible, crazy miracles, haven't we? Yeah, we've had testimonies in this place of things God is doing. Why can't he continue to do them? So we're going to trust God for that. All right, let me go back to my message. You don't have to be a priest or a missionary or an evangelist or a paid person to be a servant of God. You actually don't. When the Bible talks about priests and prophets and evangelists, it's clear that it's talking about servants of God. It's very clear. But the good news is that there are many people in the scripture who are not any one of those categories. They're not professionals. They weren't paid to do the ministry. They were not recognized as people who that was their job. In the Bible, God used evangelists and prophets and priests, but he also used kings and he used politicians and he used shepherds and he used businessmen and he used millionaires and he used farmers. All kinds of people God used. He even used prostitutes. That's another story altogether. Yeah, he did. And he used murderers. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, you've just qualified right now to be a, a servant of God. <laughs> if he can use those ones, he can use you. Yeah, he can use you. <laughs> the implication is that every single one of us can be a servant of God. There's nobody who should disqualify themselves. You don't have to have a full-time ministry position to be a servant of God. The greatest job, by the way, that you can ever have, the greatest job description that you can ever have in this life is to be a servant of the Most High God. That's the greatest thing. There's no other role. There's no CEO-ship. There's no COO. There is no CFO that can ever qualify to have a better rank than a servant of the Most High God. Am I speaking to somebody in the house today? There is no accolade the world can ever give you that is higher than working for the creator of this universe. Because when you're a servant of the Most High God, you're serving the eternal. You're serving the eternal. And so there's no better job description. And I want to say to you that God used amazing people and called them servants of God. Just like he called the prophets and the evangelists and he called all the priests that were servants of God. But God used people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And what were these guys? These guys were farmers, isn't it? They were farmers and they were ranchers. And these guys, just they used to plant crops and they used to look after cattle. And God used them. Exodus chapter 32. Can we put that verse? Exodus 32, 13. Remember your... <laughs> Can you see that? Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give you descendants in all the land, I promise them. It will be their inheritance forever. God wasn't looking for a priest. He was looking for a farmer. Isn't that amazing? God can work through anybody. Moses and David, they were not priests. They were national leaders. There were people who aspired to be national leaders. Well, David didn't, Moses did. But there were people who had national positions. David was actually a shepherd before that. But Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, it talks about, uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. Joshua 1, verse 7 says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. So God is talking about Moses saying he's my servant. Moses was never in full-time ministry if you want to call it that. Moses was trained to be a king. He was trained to be a national leader. And then after that, he was trained to be a shepherd. <laughs> he never went to Bible school. But he's God's servant. If you look at seven, Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 5, you're going to see something interesting. It says, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? Again, David never went, never went to any Bible school. He was a man who looked after sheep. That was actually his training in life, by the way. And that's what qualified him to be a king and to be God's servant, looking after sheep. Are you seeing the, the, the thing here? Uh, Job, jo Job was this guy who served God. He was actually, Job, the funny thing about the book of Job, it's one of the books, it, it, it has nothing to do with Israel. It's one of those strange Bible books that has nothing to do with Israel. Uh, Job was actually from the east. 
Uh, and there's no Israel, there's no Jew in that story at all. It's a very crazy story. In fact, when they say the East, people don't know where the East was. It could have been Japan. It could have been China. It could. I mean, n- none of us know where Job actually came from. But the one thing we know about him is that he was a millionaire businessman. The guy had holdings in almost every uh, industry of his time. He was just this guy who was such a, a baller. He was a, guy who, he, was, <laughs> he was a guy who owned it. And a guy who was a roller. He was a high roller. He had all the wealth. But here's a, Job chapter 1 verse 8. It says a very interesting thing. It says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Oh my goodness. This guy... He's a millionaire. Everybody thinks he's a millionaire. God is like, that's my servant. This guy is in his office, CEO, running many, many different corporations, running many different interests. But actually what he really is, is a servant of God. Mm, 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 mm. Two CEOs, they look the same. One is eternal. The other one is just earthly. Are you understanding what is happening here? There's a guy who you think his, 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 his card says CEO of whatever industries, but his real card says servant of the Most High God. That's what's happening in this scripture. And by the way, I only chose these examples because of the, the verses that actually explicitly call them servants, but there are many, many examples of people who are servants of God. You know people like Esther. She was a queen. She was a queen, and first of all, she was a beauty. Uh, she, walked, she walked the runway. That was her thing. She was a model. And then she became, she became a queen. And she was a servant of God. Servant of the Most High God. People thought she was a queen, but actually she had, she had a secret identity. She was a servant of the Most High God. Nehemiah, the guy who built the wall, he was actually a cupbearer to the king. He was a bodyguard. He wore secret service. He had a little thing in his ear for the king of Persia. But this guy was actually a servant of the Most High God. Nobody knows. They're just seeing this guy in his career. They have no idea that this guy is actually not connected to earthly king. He's connected to heavenly king. This guy has power behind him. Uh, Daniel. Daniel was a prime minister. I mean, this guy had so much authority, but people didn't understand his authority did not come from the guy who had appointed him. His authority came straight from heaven. That even angels were sent to do his bidding. That spiritual warfare happened in heaven because of his prayers. Can you imagine you pray and then angels start fighting demons? No, no, seriously. And you're not a pastor. You're a prime minister. Oh, may the Lord give us prime ministers like that in Africa politicians like that in this continent of ours. We need them desperately. Ah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were governors of provinces. Hey, who knows? Your, gov- your, 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 your county needs a governor like that one. Amen. Yeah, who's a servant of the Most High God? Uh, Joseph and Mary, they were just two young teenagers who had a baby. Servants of the Most High God. The disciples, what was their job description? What were they before God called, Jesus called them? They were fishermen. And there were tax collectors, any KRA agents or URA agents in the house. Don't put up your hand, we might fear you. Uh, but there were, people saw their role, but actually they were servants of the Most High God. That's who they were. Paul himself, Paul was actually a tent maker. He was not a Bible scholar. He didn't, I mean, he was not a guy in a Bible school. He was actually a tent maker. He had a, he had a trade. He made tents. He was like Paul. You guys know Paul? He's like Paul. <laughs> it's interesting. We call him Paul, the guy who does our deco. And he has beautiful tents. But he's a tent maker, servant of the Most High God. Look at your neighbor and say, Are you a servant of the Most High God? Yeah, yeah. None of these people was a pastor, but they were called. They were called. They were servants. So let's talk about, a bit about the characteristics of called people because I want to break this down for somebody in the house today. Somebody who may be doubting this word. Somebody who may, may be saying, I don't understand how this works. Uh, the characteristics of called people because Matthew chapter 22 verse 14 says, many are called but few are chosen. Amen. Many are called, few are chosen. And I'll say this. It's a very powerful verse. Many times people wonder, what does that mean? That many are, okay, it says many are invited here. Uh, but in the NLT, it says, many are called, few are chosen. And the reason is because few are, few are chosen because few accept the call. Oh, come on. Yeah? Jeez. Remember we talked about that feast. Remember the feast, the Anedea feast? The one where the guy invited all his friends, the, the important guys, and then none of them showed up. And then he said to his servants, go and compel people to come. There were many who, are, there were many who had been called, but they were not chosen because they turned down the invitation. There are many Christians today who have been called, but they refuse to be chosen. And so God has to choose other people. 
There are many people who God has given the resources to serve Him, but they've turned those resources inside out and used them to serve themselves and their ambitions. And because of that, God has to look for other people to use because they will not answer to the call. And especially educated people. Yeah, the more educated we get, the more we start feeling it's about us. The more God blesses us, the more we start feeling it's about us. And because of that, there are many who are called, but few are chosen. Few are chosen. It's the nature of human beings to be proud. It is. You know, many people look humble <laughs> because they have no money. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> My screen is freezing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's too much volume and I'll turn it down many people look humble but it's because they're broke they don't have money but let me tell you the minute they get money the last, that's the last time you'll ever see them in a spiritual space last scene they'll be telling you things like by, by the way a person with a job like mine you know I tend to be very busy very busy you know my job keeps very busy people like me are just busy <laughs> You, you pastors may not understand. A job like mine, I'm so busy. It keeps me busy. I wish you could know how busy I am. <laughs> you know, the same verse uh, in the, the Passion Translation, it says, For everyone is invited to enter in, but few respond in excellence. Few respond in excellence. There's an invite, but there are few who respond in excellence. Most respond in mediocrity. And because of that, they end up living their lives in mediocrity as well. This is the state of many Christians in the world today. We have to be honest, isn't it? There are many Christians who are not living for the kingdom. There are many Christians who are living exactly like their, their non-Christian peers. They're living for money. They're living for vacations. They're living for relationships. They're living for social media and for following. But they're not living for the kingdom. I'm not talking about you because I know you're different. But I'm talking about many, many Christians out there who live like that. And it must grieve God because he sent the invitation. You remember the master was hot. He was angry that he sent the invitation and then people did not respond. And so many people are living that way. You know, to do the work of ministry <laughs> that will reconcile sons and daughters to him, that's what God has called us to do. He wants us to do the work of ministry. He wants us to reconcile people to him. But people fail to respond to this work. They'd rather do something for themselves. Let me say this. Whether you're a director or a CEO, whether you're a stay-home mom or a student in school, God's calling is for you. Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. And your response matters. Your response matters for eternity. It matters for eternity. I bless God for Nyamo who responded to God's call. And now he's a healing evangelist. <laughs> Come on. Sharing the gospel. My goodness. Sending texts to family member or to friends saying, by the way, that son of yours who's struggling, we are coming to pray. That story is over in Jesus' name. Oh, what authority do these people have? Where are they getting it? And guess what happens when that person is healed? They'll be like, hey, okay, sour. <laughs> this one is not just anybody. You know how in the movies they say, who are you? <laughs> That's all the Marvel movies. When the, guy is, when the superpowers are seen, it's like, I thought you were my friend. Who are you? <laughs> I'm a servant of the Most High God. <laughs> That's who I am. I'm not just an earthly person. Here's my card. In fact, some of you need to print that card that says, my name, servant of the most high God. Yeah? And the other card says, prayer supplier. Remember that one? So depending on situation, you pull out the one that you need to do. So, so who are the people that God calls? Let me just say, give you a cut, several categories and just see if you identify with any of these categories, uh, whether you are the one of the people God calls. God calls failures. God calls failures. Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. It says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? You know, Moses had tried to save the Israelites out of slavery. So it's interesting. Why would he say that? Now it's, it's his chance. He tried. He, that was what he really wanted. And now he's saying, Who am I? Guess what? Moses failed badly. He had failed. He knew he had failed. In fact, he failed so bad that he killed an Egyptian operator, uh, uh, one of the guys who was a slave uh, driver there. He killed the guy and he instantly became the most wanted man in the whole of Egypt. And so he had to flee for his life. And the reason he had to flee for his life is because he went to his guys to kind of tell them, you know, guys, I'm like, us guys don't fight each other. Like, they're like, and who are you? 
who made you one of us? Who made you our judge? Like the people he was trying to deliver rejected him. <laughs> like we, we don't even know who you are. And then he realized, oh my goodness, I've failed miserably. Even the people I was trying to impress don't even know who I am. And for the next 40 years, he lived in shame of I failed. I failed. Imagine that you, you grew up in the poshest parts of town, in the king's palace, you had the best food, you had everything. And then now, for the ne next 40 years, you're a shepherd. And shepherd means you don't have intellectual conversations like you used to have in Harvard. Your most intellectual conversation is where? Psst, psst, eh, psst. <laughs> 40 years. What kind of failure do you think that guy felt? It's like he's low self-esteem. The Bible tells us he stammered. By the time he was asking that Egyptian, you notice, by the time he was killing the Egyptian and trying to lecture his, the two Israelites who were fighting, there was no stammer. I put it to you that 40 years of failure had brought a stammer to Moses. He doubted himself. He was so afraid. He, he just did not feel he could do anything. He didn't feel anybody could ever listen to him. You see all the excuses he gives God. Like, send someone else. Like, I'm not qualified. Lord, my voice. I, I, I don't even know how to speak in public. Lord, can you call Aaron? He's better at speaking. It's like he just comes up with every reason why God can't use him. But here's the thing. Many have failed here in their life assignments. Some of us have failed in, in our exams. And we consider ourselves failures. Some of us, maybe we just feel like I failed in my marriage. Maybe some of you feel like you failed in your faith. Maybe some of you just feel like you're a failure. Like you're just not the kind of person God can use. But here's the thing. God loves using failures. He loves using failures. Why? Because then His glory is seen. His glory is seen. So if you're here in this house and you're saying, who am I that God should use me? You're qualified. Mm. You're qualified. You're the kind of person that God is looking for. So that's the kind of the first person. God uses who? Failures. failures. God loves people who are failures. Number two, God calls unworthy people. God calls unworthy people. There are people who allow their feelings of unworthiness to keep them from fulfilling God's call. But you need to understand that those same feelings are actually what qualifies you to be called. The feeling of unworthiness. Anybody who feels worthy of a call is not worthy of that call. You know, if you're one of those people who feel, I'm a pastor's kid, my dad was a bishop, my grandfather was a founder of churches, my great-grandfather was the pope of the region, if you feel like that and you think that's what qualifies you to be called, God will not use you. Because God doesn't use people who feel like they're qualified. He looks, if you look, look through the scripture, by the way, he, doesn't ever, he, he never works through the pedigree. The guys in the temple were, were waiting for God to come. By the way, don't think the Pharisees were evil men in that way, like we think. These were guys who were committed to wait for God's return. They were waiting for the Messiah. And they were the ones keeping the law and making sure Israel was pure so that the Messiah would come and find Israel ready. That's what the Pharisees were. But they were so caught up on themselves and their qualifications. And they believe God cannot speak except through us. And guess where Jesus goes? Completely far from them. And the, the harshest words Jesus has are not for sinners. They are for the religious leaders of the day. Because they believe that they were leaders or they were called because they were qualified. God hates pride. So, so listen, I mean, it's interesting because there's a guy who really felt unqualified. And I'm surprised that this guy felt unqualified. You would not see, think so knowing him. But if you read John chapter 1 verse 27, you read the story of John the Baptist and he's the guy who God uses in such powerful ways. He's the guy who is, uh, uh, everybody in Jerusalem is coming to see him. Everybody is, is interested in his ministry. And then he talks about Jesus. Actually, his disciples come and tell him, by the way, do you know there's a guy who's called Jesus and, he's, and they're baptizing all the guys that used to come to us. It's like, what do we do? How do we re-strategize? That church is growing faster than ours. Uh, what are we doing wrong? And Jesus says, uh, Paul, John says, though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. It's like, John is like, I'm not qualified. I'm not the guy. I'm not even worthy. And guess what? This is the guy that God chooses to use to announce the coming of the Messiah. This guy who feels he's not worthy is the same guy that God, Jesus says, among all the sons of men, all the people who've lived before this, 
the greatest is John the Baptist. It's like all the prophets who've ever come, Isaiah, all those prophets, just call them Jeremiah, whatever they were, Elijah, Elisha. This guy is the greatest. Jesus himself said that, isn't it? But John is like, I'm not worthy. <laughs> and you know why God loves a person like that? Is because John said something in John 3.30 that tells you why God uses people who are not worthy. John 3.30, John says, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. When you know you're not worthy, you know it's not you who takes the glory. When people tell you, oh my goodness, what a powerful sermon, you're like, hey, <laughs> it had to be him, man, because I know myself. There's no way I could have done that. There's no way I could have done that. You know what happens in ministry? Ministry can be very, um, it can be very deceptive. Ministry can be very dangerous. It can be like a drug. Because what happens when you stand, in, when you stand where I stand, you see God's word coming forth, and then you see transformation before your very eyes. And many times, it's like the Holy Spirit is just using a person to speak, and then transformation is happening. And at some point, you can easily start to think that transformation is coming because of you. Man, you guys know how long I've been praying for this revival. Do you know how I come and walk around this church and call down God's power? Do you know how I've fasted for you guys? I mean, God is using me, man. It's my fasting that's bringing this. Ichabod, God's glory departs. And many churches, God's glory has departed. The, the signs and wonders are still there because the, the gift of God is not revoked. But the presence of God left a long time ago. Wow. Yeah. Because it became about the people at the front. It became about the servants of God as opposed, instead of the God who they are serving. And so we must be careful. John says, he must become greater, I must become less. That's the attitude of an unworthy person, isn't it? And so I want to say to you, if you've ever struggled with feelings of unworthiness, ah, you're not alone. You're not alone. You're qualified. You're the right person. You're the person that God can use. Oh my goodness, I have struggled with those feelings. I feel inadequate many times. I've stood in front of places. I've, I've, some pastors know what I'm talking about. I've stood somewhere, spoken, and then gone and listened to the tape and just said, oh my God, what did I say? Like I was embarrassed at myself. But you know, it's interesting. Those times when I'm least able, the times when I'm least prepared, the times when I'm least... Uh, Con, um, like, a, like I just don't even know. Like I got on stage and I was just like, oh God, help. I'm in trouble. Those are the times God has moved the most. Yeah, because it's not about my qualification. God loves to call unworthy people. Tell your neighbor, are you feeling unworthy? Then he's talking about you. Yeah, you're qualified. You're qualified. God qualifies unworthy people. Number three, God calls rejected people. People who've been rejected. He loves it. God calls rejected people. Some of you here are divorced. Some of you watching this are divorced. Or oh, you're separated. Your marriage has gone through a terrible time. It's fluffed. Some of you have gone through a rough breakup. And somebody rejected you. And it's just hurting you. It's breaking your heart. Some of you have been fired from work. And it left you with a sense of low self-esteem. Especially the men here. Uh, there's some of you who just are, you've never recovered from when you lost your job. And you just feel completely, completely rejected. You feel like you don't qualify. You just feel like you're so low. Some of you have been rejected by your parents. Some of you have been rejected by your family members. They don't speak to you. And you know, it's interesting because you can feel like you're so, so, so low. But this is exactly what happened to Moses because he's the one who was rejected. Uh, in fact, it's interesting. The words that I, that, 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 that phrase, just, just put the verse up. Exodus chapter 2, verse 12 to 14. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Verse 13. It says, the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the other one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And verse 14, the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Wow. Like, like I'm trying to help these people. I'm seeing them being oppressed. I've been praying for them. I've been wanting to do something. I've done it. I've even risked my life for them. Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing us the way you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. Not only did they do that, they actually went and leaked it to the Egyptians. Like, who is that guy? Who does he think he is? He's actually killing your own people. Like the people he was trying to save, his own people, by the way, they rejected him. And by the way, they continued to reject him because they struggled with his leadership. I think if God had not given him those signs and wonders, they would never have allowed him to become their leader. Because you notice, even with those signs and wonders, they still used to ask, and who do you think you are? You think you're the only one God can use. Like his family members struggled for a long time with the thought of why would God choose our younger brother to lead us? Why? 
And they found reasons. His own cousins, the people like Cora, uh, who are relatives, they're like, why did God choose your branch of the family? Why not ours? And there's a lot of rejection for Moses. He walked through life with a lot of rejection, with a lot of failure, that, just that sense of people rejecting him. And it was interesting, he was rejected by those people who, who he was trying to help. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, it really comforts me because it speaks of the fact that when God called his people, he says, brothers and sisters, Paul says, think of what you are when you are called. Sometimes it's good to remember who you are when God found you, because sometimes we forget. And he says, not many of you are wise by human standards. Not many of you are influential. Not many of you are of noble birth. And then verse 27, but God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. Tell your neighbor foolish. Foolish. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what God chose. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. Tell your neighbor weak. weak. Yeah, that's what you are. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. Don't tell your neighbor those things, but that's what God says. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are, verse 29, so that no one may boast before him. Wow. wow. Yeah. God doesn't want anyone boasting. I was chosen by God because I was number one in class all my life. I've always been top. Yeah. God chose me because I went to one of the best theological schools in the world. I mean, that's why God uses me. No way. That's not why God chooses you. God chooses you because of all those things. The rejected people. If you've ever been rejected, by the way, if you're in a place right now you're feeling rejected, wow. You're qualified. Holy Spirit is coming. He's looking for people like you. He will use people like you. You're the one who, you're the one who will deliver the ones who rejected you. That's Moses. Moses delivers the very people who rejected him. He pulls them out of slavery, them and their children. That's your destiny. That's who you are. That's who God is looking for. God calls people who are not believable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, God calls people who are just not believable. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. This is a very interesting one. Apostle Paul, he's like saved. He comes to church. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he was really a disciple. <laughs> like anybody here who had such a past that if people know your real story, they might not believe you're a real Christian. <laughs> your past, I can see hands going up across the room. It's like your, your past disqualifies you. If guys could only know some of the things you did, they'd move away from you. Like your chair, would, you'd be finding yourself sitting by yourself. Yeah, some, of, some people are here. Some people are here. You know, there are many people who might write you off because of your past. There are people who might look at you. They're so focused on what you, you used to be, they cannot see what God has made you to be today. Yeah. They, they, they just look at you and they can't listen. And by the way, many of these people tend to be in your family. Huh? It's like they know you. They, they saw you. They know you. It's like, who is this guy? Who is he to think he can tell us anything? We've seen him wallowing in the ditch. We've seen him failing. And it's like, yeah, you're not believable anymore. It's like they don't believe you can... You know, my story is, I, I was a guy who... <laughs> I destroyed lives. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not proud of that. I destroyed lives. God gave me the ability to lead. I didn't know what that was. And some of you know what I'm talking about. God gives you a gift and you misuse it because you don't know. Some of you, God gave you the gift of speaking. And you could always speak. But instead of using that gift to bring people to him, you used it to just make noise. <laughs> the wrong noise. Yeah. I mean, look at Hypses. Hypses must have been a noisemaker in class. But now he's using that noise to bring young people to Jesus. He's understanding the power of that gift. Yeah. Understanding the power of that gift. <laughs> Amen. Now, now there, there are many of us who, you know, people, people think, they look at you and they're like, no way. There's no way. Look at, look at how he used to dress. Look at, look at how she used to Look at how she, look at what, look at that tattoo. How can God, so I was that guy. Because for me, I even have friends in my alumni group at high school that I introduced to their first drink. And today they're still, they're still drunkards. Because I was that guy. I had influence. So I was using the influence God gave me to take people to hell. And I'm not ashamed. I'm, I'm, I'm still ashamed of that because you know what? There are some of them who've never given their lives to Jesus. Because they're like, in fact, in fact, one of them told me, but you're even the one who got, bought me my first drink. I mean, 
I've told this story at Mavuno, but there's one girl who came to my office. She was so sad. She was so broken. I was a pastor by then. And she didn't know who I was. And I ne- mentioned her name. She thought I had a gift of discernment. But I didn't. It's just that we used to party with her. I mean, she, never, she couldn't imagine that the guy she used to pa- see in the club was her pastor, was the pastor in the room. And so she began to just tell me her stories. And I stopped. I said, Anne, you don't recognize me? And she says, like, she, is this the voice of the Holy Spirit? What is this? <laughs> and so I told her, but I'm already, you don't remember we used to go to the, and she, and she just started laughing hysterically, like she lost it. <laughs> she laughed, she laughed, she laughed. She's like people who are not believable. She just laughed, laughed. And then in the middle of the laughter, I, she just started crying. Like somewhere just turned into weeping. And she just started weeping and she wept, wept. And then she just said, at the end, I, was, I brought tissues. I didn't even know what to do because I'd never had, I was like, okay, so. And then she finished weeping and she said, okay, I'd like to give my life to Jesus. I'm like, huh? <laughs> really? Like, like, I didn't say, we haven't even, I haven't even shared the gospel yet. What's happening? And she said, if God can save a girl like you and make you a pastor, <laughs> even me, I can be saved. <laughs> what? <laughs> there are some of you that are not believable. And maybe your past has made you think, God can't use someone like me. God can use Pastor James, but hey, for me, I'm just, let me just, let me just carry chairs. Let me just be a background person because God can't use someone like me. But I'm saying, listen, if you're not a believable person, the Holy Spirit is here today looking for people like you. You're the kind of person God calls. You're just absolutely the kind of person God calls. Wow. David, like, can you imagine how you catch feelings when this, the, the prophet looks at all of your brothers and he's like, it must be this one. No, it's not that one. And your father is like, okay, it must be this one. And like, your dad doesn't suggest you. <laughs> it's like he brings all your other brothers and the prophet keeps saying, no, not that one. And then the dad is like, okay, then it's not one of my kids. Then the prophet is the one who has to ask, but don't you have another son somewhere? Oh, Yeah. It's a guy called David. Like, I'd catch such feelings if it was me, seriously. Like, seriously, Dad, you didn't even think I could be one of those guys. Not believable by your own father. Yeah. That's the kind of person God is looking to use. If you're here and you're not believable, trust me, you're qualified for God's calling. You're the kind of person God wants to use. All right. God calls people with an inferiority complex. (laughs) Am I speaking to somebody in the house? Yeah. You know, the ones who are saying yes don't have inferiority complex. The ones who have kept quiet are the ones who have it. (laughs) You know some people. Yeah. Yeah. There are many people who struggled with that inferiority complex. I've talked about Moses. But there's another guy called Jeremiah. And Jeremiah really, really struggled when God called him. Because he just didn't feel like he was the kind of guy God could use. And Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 to 6. He says, The word of the Lord came to me saying... Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Come on, somebody. Ah. <laughs> like, before I formed you in the womb, it means before your parents did anything. Isn't that crazy? Like, God didn't know you when you became conceived. Already, he knew you. Your identity was already in his mind. And then he says, before you were born, I set you apart. I called you. Listen, this is the whole thing about it. all of us are called. And then he says, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Come on, somebody. There are prophets to nations who are sitting in this house today. And they need to understand that they are called. They need to understand that they are called. And let's see what he says. He says what? Alas. (laughs) That's a bad word to start a conversation with. Alas. Alas. Sovereign Lord, I said. I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. Like, God has told you, I knew you before you were conceived. Surely that should mean something. I had even already written your job description before your parents met. You are going to be a prophet to the nations. And then he's like, God, okay, just in case you didn't notice. Alas. Alas. That's what that means. It's like, just in case you didn't notice, God, I'm too young and I don't know how to speak. Am I speaking to somebody in the house today? Alas. That's what you've been telling God. Alas. Alas, God. You don't, in case you haven't noticed, I'm that person who's too young. I'm too small. My voice is too high. Nobody ever looks at me in the room. I'm those people when I stand in front of a chair, people see the chair, they don't see me. 
Am I talking to somebody in the house today? Yeah. I'm so shy. Alas, God, I'm too shy for you to use me. You know, many Africans tend to have an inferiority complex. I've seen this. I'm too young. I'm a student. I'm still single. I'm too poor. I don't speak good English. I'm still shy in front of people. I'm not a pastor. We say all these things. We say all these things. And Moses had all those excuses. We talked about them earlier. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent. By the way, that's a lie. Because he was trained in the schools, the, the universities of Egypt. But he said, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. It's like, Lord, I'm just not there. It's like, please use someone else. By the way, is there anybody here who ever thinks, Lord, just use someone else? Yeah, just use someone else. Please. Let's respect each other, God. Just, just the levels here. Just call Pastor James. <laughs> Give prophecy to someone else. Don't, don't. I'm just not that person. Now, if you, this, this really, by the way, guys, I, I hope you're hearing what I'm talking about. That God will use you if you will say yes. He will. He will. Because many are invited, few are chosen. But guess what? To be chosen, you choose first. Because the invitation was already there. God has already said, you're my servant. Now you have to actually stand and say, listen, God, I'm yours. I will serve you. You actually have to accept the invitation. Don't read about people who rejected the master and say, oh, those bad people. Because today, we have to make a choice. Will I be a servant of the Most High God? And I believe that call is for everybody in this room. This is not a theoretical sermon, by the way. This sermon is going somewhere. It's saying that, listen, from today, you are a servant of the Most High God. Because if I haven't mentioned your category, then you should understand. Uh, in fact, there's a category that I, uh, the Lord gave me. Uh, just now when we are going through worship. Um, I think this, I don't know what Pastor Mike Conan said and something came to my mind. There's another category of people uh, that God uses. Let me see if my computer will boot up and I can use it. <laughs> okay. Um, God? Oh, yeah. God calls people who've messed up. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, 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 the Holy Spirit told me there are people here who've messed up bad. Really messed up. Like if people knew the mess you have in your life, it would be crazy. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 59, Paul had really messed up. He had killed people. He had persecuted the church. He had destroyed many people. And he says, 1 Corinthians 15, 59, for I'm the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not even worthy. Yeah? He'd messed up. And there are some of us, by the way, we've messed up. Even, the way, even where we're living right now is a mess. The person we're staying with is a mess. There, there are some of us, by the way, we're here because the Holy Spirit has compelled us to be here, but you know there's a mess where you came from. Yeah, I've left a mess back there. And the pastor doesn't know my mess, and I'd hate for him to find out. You're in a mess. But here's the crazy thing. God looks for people like you. Like I'm wondering, why would he pick... For the guy, you, you think about it, there's, there's 12 apostles in Jerusalem. There are hundreds of Christians. In fact, there are thousands. There are 5,000 of them who have been scattered across the world and they're preaching the gospel. Why would God in his infinite wisdom look for the one person who is a murderer and a thief and a guy who's persecuting the church and say, this is the one I'm used, going to use to write half the New Testament? Wow. That's a God we serve. Your mess doesn't disqualify you. In fact, your mess is the one that allows you to be in a position where you need God's mercy the most. Because the one who's forgiven much, loves much. Amen. And our Father, by the way, is in the house today to forgive you. Amen. There are some of you today who are, you're going to, you walked in with a mess, you're going to walk out a saint Amen. with white raiment because God is going to restore you today. Amen. Today, it's going to happen today. We're going to pray. Today, we're going to have a, a prayer service. Well, we're going to have some time for prayer and prophecy. And I believe that God is going to restore very many people in this house. Amen. But listen, don't let, don't, don't, make, don't let that mess in your life make you think God can't use you. Yes. Yeah. Some of you, God is going to just right-size some things, and you'll be amazed. In fact, your mess will be your story. Amen. It'll become your message. It's a thing God is going to use to bless people. So if you've ever fail, failed or felt unworthy or been rejected or not believable 
or you're one of those people who've struggled with an inferiority complex, or you've messed up, you're exactly the kind of person God is looking for. So let's talk really quickly about why you should serve the Lord. Why, why should you be bivocational? Why is this not a choice for you? Why is it so important that every single one of you understands that your business card should read servant of the most high God? Why is it important that you cannot be a plain, ordinary Christian anymore? Uh, by the way, there's no such thing as a plain, ordinary Christian. We've messed the word Christian. Uh, you cannot be a follower. You, you cannot be a, a disciple if you have not taken up the cross and followed Jesus, if you have not accepted his call. And so why is it so critical that from today, everything in your life aligns to serving God? Why is that so critical? Number one, all things will be added to you. God has a, amazing gifts for those who serve him. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all things will be added to you. All things will be added to you. Oh my goodness. There are people in life who are running after all things. There are people in life who are aligning their lives to run after money. They're aligning their lives to run after career. They're aligning their lives to get many likes because they think when they have many likes, they'll be popular. They'll do things. Listen, the Bible says, seek the kingdom. All things will follow you. They'll be added. They'll be added. There's a great, um, there are great examples of this in Scripture. King, King Uzziah. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, uh, King Uzziah is one of those amazing kings uh, who was a king after God's heart. It says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his fi father Amaziah had done. And then verse 5, he sought the Lord during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of the Lord. As long as he sought the, the Lord, God gave him success. Mm. As long as you're seeking the Lord in that business, God will give you success. As long as you're seeking the Lord with your career, God will give you success. This is, this is, this is the Lord we serve. That he do, he's not the God that you serve, and then he will leave you out. He will actually give you success. All things will be added to, him, to you. King Hezekiah is another great king who served God, and he saw the same testimony. King Hezekiah, in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 21, he says, In everything he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought God and worked wholeheartedly. Hmm. And so he prospered. A king should prosper because he has people working for him. A king should prosper because he has a powerful army. A king should prosper because people are paying taxes. A king should prosper because he's taking over territories with his army. That's not why Hezekiah prospered. Hezekiah prospered because he sought the Lord wholeheartedly. Yeah. Listen, you're going to prosper. I know prosperity is your problem. That's why some of you are not following Jesus. That's why you're not serving him. That's why you're content to just come to church and sit in your chair. And then on mon Monday to Saturday, do your thing. But listen, seek the Lord wholeheartedly. You will prosper. Amen. All other things will be added to you. Our father is that kind of father. He's such an amazing father. I think this is one thing that um, I'll say for Pastor Caro and I. And uh, Pastor Caro is going to come and pray for us at the end of this message. Um, you need to hear her voice. Um, yeah, you do. <laughs> But, but God has been so gracious to us as a couple. And she can tell you, ever since we were students, uh, young people in our 20s, we've lived a life of ease. We have. Like, I'm shocked. The reason I didn't want to be a pastor is because I didn't want to be poor and I wanted to have an easy life. <laughs> we have lived lives of ease. Like, I saw my friends who worked in different careers living lives of pain and stress and struggle. In the time when we thought we would really struggle and have problems, as we sought the Lord, He prospered us. He blessed us. And He, he gave us not just the things money buys. He gave us things that money cannot buy. He gave us a great marriage where we are fantastic friends. We enjoy each other. He gave us amazing children. You can't buy that. Let me tell you, money cannot buy you that. He gave us a home with security where people feel secure in that home. One of our friends who is in this house told us, I wish my... I, 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 I wonder whether, my, my wife was telling me, I wonder what it would make my kids love me the way your kids love you when they're older. I mean, they just love us. They're teenagers and they love their parents. <laughs> Do you remember loving your parents a lot when you're a teenager? Like they love us. Like even I don't think I love my parents the way my kids love me. That's a gift of God. It's a blessing. God has given us uh, just opportunities. Ease. I, like I can't even explain it. But this has only come not from striving, but from following. It's, a, it's the only simple way I can break it down. Like, honestly, sometimes I even think, Lord, what can I teach people? Because 
all the blessings you're given have come from you. <laughs> in fact, many times people would come and ask me, teach a financial class and teach us how to prosper. And I'd be like, okay, number one, surrender to Jesus. Number two, pray with your spouse and become one. <laughs> number three, trust in the Lord with all that. <laughs> So, okay, because I can't teach that, then I'll teach them some other principles, and then I'll, I'll say at the end, this is the most important thing. But really, for me, it's not the most important thing. It's the only thing. Yeah. It really is the only thing, guys. Yeah. You will prosper. You will prosper. Stop fearing. Some of you right now, you're in a place, you're stuck in your career, because, and that career does not allow you to serve the Lord. And you're stuck because you're like, but Lord, what if? I hate it. I know this is not where I'm supposed to be, but what if? Who will provide for me? Who will provide for me? And my goodness, goodness. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and he rewards those who honestly seek him. Yeah, he does. And by the way, faith is defined here. Faith is believing, number one, God exists. But number two, <laughs> how that is shown, because I can say God exists, God exists, God exists. But how do I show that I really believe that? I have to believe that he rewards those who seek him. Which means then I align my life to seek him, understanding he will reward me. True faith is always shown by my choices. It's not shown by my profession, it's shown by my choices. When I serve God and I know he will reward me, boom, I have faith. And God is pleased with me. Now, number two, not only will you prosper in that way, not only will things be added to you, but number two, you will experience divine protection. It's just one of the promises of God. You will experience divine protection. Psalm 143 verse 12 it says, in your unfailing life, love, silence my enemies, destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. Amen. This is a promise of servants, guys. When you serve the Most High King, this is what he does. And you can pray that prayer. I mean, that's a bold prayer to pray. Silence my enemies. Mm. <laughs> I love that. Like, destroy my foes. And then he says to God, and here is why I'm praying this prayer, because I am your servant. Yeah, you look after your servants. God looks after his servants. He protects his servants. And I can pray with boldness because I know God looks after his servants. Uh, Daniel chapter 3 verse 24. Very interesting example of that. King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and we threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed and the fourth looked like a son of the gods. Come on, somebody. <laughs> This is how you start to walk and people are seeing the Son of God next to you. This is how people think that they fired you, your life would be finished, and they find you prospering. This is how people curse you and they think that witchcraft and curses will destroy you, and they find that you're still rising. There's a Son of God who's walking by you. Protection is your portion when you serve Him. This is what the Scriptures say. Serve Him wholeheartedly, and you will experience divine protection. You know, it's interesting because... Yesterday, Pastor Gordy and I and uh, our, uh, my, uh, Pastor Noel and Pastor Trevor were in Pastor Godwin's car. Pastor Godwin has a really nice small, is it a parcel? It's a note. It's one of those really nice small cars. So we're in it, and I'm sitting in the front with Pastor Gordy. Pastor Trevor is sitting with Pastor Noel. And we're entering the highway, and we just heard a huge sound. Like we had a, a thud that hit out, like our car was hit. And we came out running. I mean, because we were shaken. So we came out running, and the truck that hit us was so big, it's like I couldn't even, even standing, the, 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 the driver's window was above us. So Pastor Godwin had seen him coming, and he hooted, but the guy wasn't paying attention. So he kind of rammed into us. But we, it's like, so the car is here, Pastor Godwin's car is here. The truck, I have to do this to get to the, the bottom of the window. It's like a big truck. And so we came out, and the guy's like, oh, where were you guys? What's wrong with you? And of course, we're all shaken. I'm not even, I'm even, for me, the first thing I looked at was Pastor Godwin's car. Like, do we have a car? <laughs> and to kid you not, and Pastor Godwin can actually testify, I assumed that the, bon the boot of the car would be on the ground. It was such a big thud, or at least his bumper, if nothing else. So I came out, and I'm like, huh? Then we were shocked, because we looked, and we just saw a, a scratch. We saw some scratches on the side, huh? And we're like, huh? So the guy is talking to us, oh, it wasn't my fault. Oh, we just looked at him and we just even, Pastor Godwin just gave me a signal. We just walked back to the car. We just left him. We drove off. Now, the one thing that was shocking is his whole entire bonnet was on the ground. Like, true? Like, this thing just fell. 
Like it was, we left the thing in a mess. He hit us in our little tiny car, which the metal, you could tell the metal in his car was like it's a serious, it's serious metal. Ours is Japanese metal. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not serious metal. But let me tell you, in fact, we kept talking about, in fact, Pastor, Pastor Trevor said the way the glory of the anointing is in this car. He was talking about the fact that he has a lot of glory of anointing, but we laughed about it. We, we were cracking jokes as we drove off from that place. My goodness, he will post angels to guard over you. That's Jehovah Jireh. Yeah, he cares. Pastor Milton, the other day, told us a crazy story when he was on leave, when he was driving in the highway. Pastor Milton, remember telling us that story? And he just felt... It was, it was supernatural, wasn't it? And it's like his car, he's driving on the highway at, how, many, how fast were you going? 20 kilometers an hour, it was up a hill. And all of a sudden, boom, he was hit on the side. And like, hit hard. And his car was now going on the side, like he was rammed from the side. And he went all the way to almost a ditch, and then another force stopped the car, boom. And he could have actually fallen over. But something just as violent as the first just stopped the car. And then he came out. And Pastor Milton, what, what was there? What did you see? The car, is still having a dent. the car has a dent on the side where it was hit. And uh, the people who were driving behind me uh, were like, whoever is my God, uh, they were like, whoever is my God and whatever I pray, I should thank him right now. Because they've never seen anything like that. Yeah. Because this car was skidding uh, at almost now 100 kph. After uh, it was hit. By, after it was hit by the, uh, on the side. And they're like, we don't even know what stopped you. So here's the crazy thing. They didn't see what hit him. And they didn't see what stopped him. They were riding behind him and they just saw his car all of a sudden go. <laughs> and then it was stopped. So first of all, they didn't see what hit him. And then they thought he was going to go over, and then they saw something stopped him. And the joke is that that thing that stopped it, the car went back to the road facing the direction I was supposed to be heading going home. <laughs> you will experience divine protection, God's people. God protects his servants. It's a good thing to serve God. It's a good thing to serve God. Number three, you will experience divine fulfillment. Divine fulfillment. First Corinthians 15, verse 58. It says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Mm. You will never labor for the Lord in vain. You never will. Your labor in the Lord is never in vain. The only two things that last in, in this world forever. One is God's word, the other is people's lives. People are eternal and God's word. The only two things in this earth that are eternal. All the money you make in this world, you will leave it here. All the shoes you buy in your wardrobe, you will leave them here. In fact, they'll be thrown away. You know, they just become somebody's problem. In fact, if you have very many of them, it becomes a big problem for the person you leave behind. That's how it is. Can I be real? Yeah. Or anything you leave behind on this earth, will just you, anything you accumulate, you will leave behind. The two things that are eternal, they will be in heaven or afterlife. Number one is God's word. That will always last. Number two is people's lives. For people's lives, there will be two de destinations. They'll either be with God or away from God forever. So, so when you invest in those things, my goodness, let me tell you, there's such a satisfaction. There's such a, there's such a purposefulness. Because I'm working for things that count. I'm working for things that matter. It's not to say that your job doesn't matter, but it's understanding that my job is to support me in my mission, in my calling. The thing that really counts. And Acts chapter 13, verse 36, it talks about David who did this. It says, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. I love that. And he decayed. The body decayed. He didn't decay, but he fell asleep and his body decayed. But I love the fact that he didn't die before he had served God's purpose in his generation. Come on, are you going to serve God's purpose in your generation before you fall asleep? Yeah. You don't have, the one thing that you don't have in time, the one thing you can never multiply in this world is time. Every day, you have opportunity. Every day, you have certain minutes of the day. You will never recover them. It's just the way that the Lord created the earth. 
You have one life, one opportunity. And you have one opportunity to live the purpose of God in your generation. David did it, and then he was able to fall asleep. So guys, hey, you'll be so, you'll be so encouraged. Let me just tell you something. Money does not satisfy. When you're broke, you think money will solve your problems. It doesn't. I'm glad I'm a pastor because I pastor people who don't have money, and then I pastor people who have a lot of money. And I can tell you, it's not always one-to-one. <laughs> you would think it's directly proportional. Joy is proportional to money. That's what people think. The more money someone has, the happier they are. And the more money they continue to have, the more happiness they have. It's actually not proportional that way. I've done a wedding for a couple. I remember one example of one day. I had two weddings in one day. Uh, the days I used to do a lot of weddings. And there was one couple who, they did their wedding for like 100,000 shillings, um, which is $1,000. A thousand, a thousand that was their total wedding budget. It was a cheap wedding. Nice, easy. Uh, I think they had snacks, tea and snacks afterwards. It was uh, some, some really, it was, it was nice. It wasn't cheap. They had done it well, tastefully. But you could tell they were not splashing on that. They didn't have the money to splash. But let me tell you, it was such a joyful wedding. Like all their friends from the life group were there. Guys were rejoicing. They had walked this journey with this couple. Their pastors were there. It was so much joy. Like honestly, it, it's like even when the bride was marching in, guys are doing cut calls. It's like guys are clapping. It was wild. It was uncontrollable. It was such a fun wedding to do. I know with Pasi, you've probably done weddings like those. Where it's just, the house is just exploding with joy. You can, only, you can hardly even control the crowd. Like, okay, guys, hush up. We need to do a wedding here. <laughs> After that, I drove. It was, I think the wedding was at Thomas Bernardo's, uh, which is the children's home that was hosting it. I drove all the way to Windsor Hotel, very posh five-star hotel. And these guys had a wedding that must have cost 4 million Kenya shillings. Easy. You know, $40,000 at least. And that was a long time ago. I'm talking about over, maybe over 10 years ago. So it was, it was a, one of the most expensive weddings I'd ever been to. I mean, you drive in, you're the pastor, they come and get you, there's some outriders, they pick, they get you from the car, there are people collecting your things. It's like it was a hookup. They have, as you're walking past the reception venue, they have a whole, you know those ones where they have a whole cow going round? <laughs> it, it was those weddings, you know. You, you've been to one of those maybe. It's just one of those weddings. And I remember standing in front of the couple and they marched in. And they came, and they were both extremely wealthy, extremely wealthy. And they kind of came in front of me. And the one thing I noticed, they didn't look at each other the whole wedding. And there was just no joy. Like, nobody was clapping. Everybody just did what the pastor told them. They, start, they uh, sat and they stood. And I could just tell there's no Jesus in this place. And I looked at that and said, my goodness, I would much rather be that couple. Fulfilled, loving God, serving God. And this one's here who have money and nothing. Misery. Misery. And sure enough, by the way, I, I don't even think their marriage lasted a year, by the way. Huh? There are some things money doesn't buy. There are some things money doesn't buy. Money doesn't satisfy. Possessions don't satisfy. Positions don't satisfy. Fulfillment is something money can't buy. And God gives it in plenty to his servants. Babe, we've enjoyed fulfillment, haven't we? Yeah. Even when we were broke, like... So broke, <laughs> living behind a butchery in the Greaty Corner and having a two-room house with bathrooms shared with the other 10 houses in our, what we call here Plot 10. We were so happy. Like, we were so joyful. We were so fulfilled serving God. Yeah, money can't buy that, guys. And some of you know what I'm talking about because you have a lot of money and you know what I'm talking about. It's not always, it doesn't always equate to fulfillment. All right, number four, you will be distinguished. I need to move on. You'll be distinguished. Malachi chapter 3, verse 17 to 18. It says, on the day that I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. Notice. And then it says, and you will again, you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who don't. God is prophesying. He's saying a time is coming when you will see the distinction between those who served God and those who served themselves. God will distinguish. Right now, you may not feel like it as you're serving Him, but a time is coming when God will distinguish. There will be a distinction between those who serve God and those who don't. And you're going to see it. 
I'm telling you, it's such a powerful thing. Such a powerful thing. And the distinction of people who serve God is a lifelong and afterlife distinction. You know, my dad, like I told you, he's a, he was a very important guy. A powerful uh, government official. All the parks. But the funny thing is, nobody today knows. You see him, he has a bald head. He's a humble short man. He looks just like any old guy. You'd pass him, like you just pass him. He's just a nice old guy. Nobody has ever saluted him ever since he left the office. But the funny thing is, because my dad was also a servant of the Most High God, he was a bivocational pastor. So as he served the government, he was also a servant of the Most High God. Guess what happened? When he left, when he retired from civil service, he went into the church. He was an excellent administrator. He had learned all the skills in the government. So he came in now full time because he was serving. By the way, I remember when we grew up, he's the one who built the church that we went to. He was part of the team that helped build the church using his, his administrative and engineering resources. Uh, St. Barnabas Otiende, some of you know that church. Uh, that was our home church. We grew up there. When he retired, now he said, I'm ready. Uh, I've done my time. I want to even now serve full time because I've served part time all this time. And he went into the church, and for the next 10 years, from 55 to 65, he worked full-time in the church. He helped, I think he worked in three different parishes, they, they posted him, and everywhere he went, he left a big building, because he's just that gifted guy, who, he's a good fundraiser, and he's a great administrator. And then after that, he retired, and today he lives a life where he's a, he's a retired clergy, he, he, like before COVID, he preached every weekend, like he's in so much demand. He has so many spiritual children, like we, we often get, like whenever we come to a function and we say we are his children, people tell us, we also are his children. <laughs> like, like, like we know you guys are his, but, but we are all his children here. Let's not feel too special. We are all his children. <laughs> he has so many people who claim him, people who love them. I mean, Caro can tell you, one of our biggest frustrations is whenever we plan an intimate family dinner, we have no idea who can break into that house. Like you just find a bus of people coming to say, we just came to see our spiritual father. Like people love them. People love them. They are old. The world has forgotten them, but in the kingdom, they have significance. And let me tell you, it's so crazy. I mean, you, some of you know my, sis, my sister, my older sister passed away during COVID when they had restrictions on the number of people who could come. Like, we had 1,500 people show up at that funeral. Like, it's like people just said, we don't care. We cannot allow this man to bury his daughter and we're not there. Ah, distinguished. God will give you the distinction that matters. He will set you up. And I look at those, in fact, Carol and I always say, if we could only be half the pastors this couple is, they have loved people all their lives. They are incredible ministers of God. They've served God. And they've been a model to us that serving God pays. Amen. It works. Number five, you will not serve God's enemies. Yeah. When you serve God, you will not serve God's enemies. You see, serving God is critical because we were all born to serve something. Every one of us was born to serve something. Who will you serve? Who will you work for? Who will you wake up early to work for? Who will you take instructions from? Where will you spend your time? What will you trade your life for? What will you die for? When God offers you a chance to serve, it's because he knows you are created to serve something or someone. And all of us were. I remember one of our good friends, um, he worked for a corporate. Um, Pastor Karen and I have this couple that we really love. They're an older couple. And he worked for a corporate. He was such a distinguished guy. He made money, belonged to the nicest clubs uh, back in the day, 70s, 80s. And what happened to this guy is by the time he retired, his health was such a mess. He was a regional guy, would travel, do everything. Like he was used up by the company like this. Like they gave him all the perks. But by the time he finished, his health was even broken. Like they, they just consumed him. He, gave, he had traded his life to make money for wicked people. Like, that was what his life counted for. But by God's grace, God gave his wife uh, divine anointing. That's how we became such good friends, because the wife got the anointing of hubs, like my wife. Uh, actually, she's actually one of, one of Carol's mentors, Pastor Carol's mentors, and she's a great woman, a godly woman. So she used those to treat her husband, restore him to health. And today he lives a life, the second part of his life, he's living it with purpose, serving his community, being a blessing to many. But this is what happens, you know? God offers you a chance... <laughs> to escape the enemy of your soul, to solve the thing that you don't even believe in. He gives you a chance to use mammon, unrighteous mammon to serve God's kingdom. Yeah. So, you know, the work of God is funded by those people who are anti-God. That's what God is giving you a chance to do because he wants you to understand that you, don't, you shouldn't serve the alternatives, the enemy of your soul. That, Deuteronomy chapter 28, 
Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you could put that verse. He says, this is something he says, and this is that verse that talks about just some of the things that happen to people who don't serve God. He says, because you did not serve God, the Lord your God, joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity. Come on, just leave that out. Just go back again. I want someone to really see this. Maybe they were writing notes so they didn't see it. Because you did not serve the Lord your God, joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity. Some of you right now, you're in a time of prosperity. And he says, verse 48, Therefore, in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and dire poverty, you will serve the enemies of the Lord that the Lord sends against you. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. He's like, look, I gave you a chance to serve me. I gave you prosperity to serve me. But because you didn't use it, then I'm going to say, fine, I've removed my protection from you. You serve your enemies. You serve your enemies. And that's what happens to these guys. Uh, called the Israelites. There are many people who are created with amazing gifts to serve God. Many of us were given amazing gifts. Wow! <laughs> Incredible gifts. Hey, Pastor CJ, this man has, well, isn't he gifted? Yeah. I love this man. So, gi so gifted. <laughs> Pastor CJ, I'm glad you're serving God. I'm glad you said yes to the call. Yeah. You are going to be so significant in the kingdom. Yes. You will do huge things for him. Yeah. I bless God for you. you, you, you. In ministry, and he fought, fought, fought. He wanted to be a rich. But I praise God for his mercy. Yeah. Because now his life is impacting, impacting impacting. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to impact. This stuff of I just give my tithe and then I leave the pastors to do their work while I serve somebody else. That's not God's plan for you. Amen. All of us are called. Every one of us are called. There are many people who are given those gifts to serve God. God gave them resources. God gave them abilities. Every, every, they have an iron yoke on their head and they're basically building financial kingdoms for unbelievers. Why would that be fulfilling for you? That I'm building a financial kingdom for unbelievers. That, that place I work, it's owned by non-believers. They're not involved in the kingdom of God. They're not invested in that. So I need to have my own agenda why I work for them. I'm here as a servant of the Most High God. I'm not here as your servant. I'm not going to spend my life just to make you rich. There's a reason you gave me this career. There's a reason God planted me in this place. It's what I can become a kingdom financier and I can become a kingdom servant and serve God's purposes in and out of that organization. That's why God put you here. And God did not put you to build financial kingdoms, to trade your life to build kingdoms for people who Satan rejoices in. That's not God's plan for your life. God created you for more. Building the agendas of proud men and women, that's not your, your portion in Christ Jesus. Yeah, that's not your portion. When God hires you to work for one of these multinationals, remember you're under God's instructions there. You're a servant of the Most High God. They don't dictate to you. It's God who tells you what he wants you to do there. Daniel worked for unrighteous people. He worked for people who are opposed to God's agenda. But he thrived and the agenda of God thrived because he knew who his real master was. And guess what? Because he understood who God was and he was not serving the king, he was a better, he was a better worker for the king. And the king recognized his value. Because he understood this guy has values. You know, when you're so fearful because you're afraid of what the boss will say and you're afraid that they'll transfer you, you're not even able to speak your mind. You're not a good employee. You're not. Even a good manager, you're not. But when you understand, I was sent here by the Most High God. And my agenda is, yes, to establish God's kingdom in this company. That there will be no corruption here. That things will run righteously. That people will value employees. God, va God has a plan for that place. But in addition to that, that I will have time to serve God in ministry. God wants that. And sometimes, by the way, some of you need to say no to promotions. Yeah. Look, 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 look closely at what they're promoting you to do. Just ask yourself. Because I can tell you, there's no company that exists to make you rich. They're not giving you that promotion because they love you. They're giving it because they want more of you. So you also have to ask, is this an opportunity for the kingdom or is this thing just going to take me away from God and from ministry? And I'll be so tired I can't even go to church. 
And at that point, you're going to have to say, uh, excuse me, I'm fine. We had a good mentor. Remember Mr. Njeru? And he worked for one of the corporates, the big corporates of the time. And at one point, he, he and his wife made a decision. This is the best position for us. He had a position that allowed him to have time for his family, time to travel and do ministry, and he loved it. And the next role after him would just tightly constrain that time, and he would have no time for God's work. And so he and his wife made a decision. Actually, we, we are okay here. And so many of the guys, he used to tell us, many of the young guys he trained, they passed him, and they kept going. And he retired at that position. But that man and his wife have had significant impact in ministry. I mean, they impacted our marriage greatly, I mean, as mentors. And they served, even till today, they serve the Lord. I can tell you they're such significant, they must be in their, their 70s, 80s, probably, 80s now. Yeah, but even today, if I mention their name, some of you here will know them because of choices they made. So, so this, this is, the world will never teach you this, that you can actually say no because you have another agenda. But this is what happens when you understand who you're serving. You're not here to serve their agenda. You're here to serve God's agenda. And so, yes, if the promotion will help me travel and go to places where I can help start discipleship groups and bless, aha, hallelujah, this is God's work. Let's do it. If the promotion will shut me in an office, I can't even go to church on Sunday. And there are people in Mavuno who are like that now. They don't go to church even on Sunday because they work every day of the week. And I'm saying, listen, you actually look for that job. Maybe it's time for you to look for another one. Maybe it's time for you to say, God, this cannot be your will. I know they're paying me a lot of money, but I'm not here as a servant to make other people rich, enemies of God rich. Okay, am I speaking to somebody in the house today? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't allow, you, you can't be locked up by the enemy in the way. Because sometimes the enemy is smart enough to lock you up. He can see this one will cause trouble for me. Let me promote him. <laughs> Let me offer a promotion that will shut him away from his destiny. Yeah, the devil is quite tricksy. He knows how to do that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. It says, verse 20. Oh, okay, fine. Just leave it there. Don't even go. I think I like that one. The, the, the earth, when all I'm thinking about is filling my bank account, I became that guy who has 20 billion and then I die. What is that about? Then what? But hey, what about using all the resources God has given me to bless the work of God, to invest in eternity? Yeah, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Yeah? No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters because either you're going to love one and hate the other. That's what the Bible says. You'll be devoted to one, you'll despise the other. You can't serve God and money. That's not God's intention. Don't wait till you're older to serve the Lord. If you die before go serving God, you'll have failed in your assignment on earth. Yeah. If you're still waiting for, let me just first get my money in place, let me get my retirement in place, let me get my passive income in place, and then after that I can serve God, you'll have wasted your life. You'll have missed out on your assignment. All of us have to become disciples. This is what it is. We have to learn how to make disciples. Because that's what our agenda is. I'm in that co company to make disciples. I'm in that job to make disciples. Luke 19, verse 31 I love that verse. I shared it earlier. Um, they asked, okay, it's going to come up. But it says, if anyone asks you, are you losing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Okay, yeah, yeah sorry. I hadn't given you that verse. I just remembered. Do you remember the verse about the donkey? If anyone asks you, I, what are you guys doing with the donkey? The master has need for it. The master has need for it. Oh, my goodness. God has need of your house. The master has need of that big house he gave you. Yeah, he does. Even if it's a small one, your SQ, God has need for it. It's for the sake of the kingdom that he's allowed you to have it. God has need of that office. He's the one who gave it to you. It's a master's office. That donkey was not given for that. Have you noticed? That donkey was, even when it was a baby, it was given to that guy. Its destiny was that the master would ride it one day. It was there for the master's business. The Lord gave you that house for his business. That office, that business he's given you, the master has need of it. That, that, that car he gave you, the master has need for it. That marriage he gave you, the master has need for it. Those gifts that God has given you, the master has need for them. He has use for them. He didn't just give it to you for your enjoyment. He didn't just give it to you so that you can grow fat. He gave it to you that you may yield it for him to use. It's your tool for kingdom business. Now we're going to be commissioning you all this afternoon as bivocational pastors. News flash. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's what you are. That's what you are. Remember we say, anybody who's saying, hey, I'm not qualified, uh, 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 go back to your notes. Go back to your notes. Remember what we said, you're exactly the kind of person God wants to have in his ministry. We want to commission you as God's servants who will serve him and bring healing and salvation to a hurting and dying world. That's what we want to commission you as. We want to commission you as people who will go and just speak blessing wherever you go. You'll be healing agents of God in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces. That's what we're going to be commissioning you. We're going to trust God that he will release all spiritual gifts you need for the work of serving him. So we're going to be asking for a release of gifts this afternoon. Every gift you're going to need for it. Because God uses people just like you. You're qualified for him to use. So I'm going to be praying for you in just a minute. uh, Because I want to conclude. I'm going to conclude. In fact, let me just invite Pastor Carol to come. Because we want to conclude. So, ha, ah, any called people in the house? Any servants of the Most High God in the house? Any bold people in the house? Yeah. That's us. That's us. By the way, it's not by might or by power. It's not even by psych or by shouting. It's by the Spirit of the Lord. Yeah. I may still be trembling on the inside, but greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. I have power within me to do God's will. And so, Pastor Kari, you're going to be praying for God's people just as we, as we end this time. And let me just ask, I taught you some three Greek words. I entrusted you with three Greek words. What were they? Anakazo, which means? Compel. Compel. That's your job description. That's what God is sending you out into the world to do. Compel people to come to Jesus. The second word was what? Biazo, which means what? Force, violence. God is asking you to stop being shy, to stop thinking about yourself. It's not about you. The violent are taking it by force. The kingdom is advancing and people like Nyamo are taking it by force. They're spending, they're spreading the word of God with force and its kingdom is advancing. The third word was what? An idea. And it means what? Shameless audacity. Oh, come on. It's time for shameless audacity, people. When you understand which kingdom you represent, you have shameless audacity. You have shameless audacity. Let me just tell you, if Prince William wants to come here and do whatever he wants to do, he doesn't ask. He just shows up. And he does his business. Why? Because he understands the kingdom he represents. Yeah. And he knows, by the way, Kenya will not tell him, oh, there's COVID, and oh, our airports are closed. And he understands the authority. He just shows up. He probably just come in a private jet and he's here. He understands his kingdom. Let me tell you guys, don't wait to be invited in. You understand your kingdom. You understand who you represent. Some of you, you've got siblings in the house who are not believers. You do. And God has given you the tools. Anakazo. Compel. And how do you compel them? Be a prayer supplier. Be a prayer supplier. By the way, it's such an easy thing. Just pray for people. Oh, your child is sick. In Jesus' name, that child, I'm coming in the evening to pray for that child. That disease will be over in Jesus' name. Mm. God, I know you want that person to be saved, so why won't you answer that prayer? Remember, miracles are not for believers. Miracles are for unbelievers. The reason we're not even experiencing miracles in our lives is because we're praying all our prayers for ourselves. Miracles are signs. Signs that people would know the kingdom. And so it's time for us to turn our prayers outwards. And start praying for people around us to be healed. In the office, somebody's stressed, somebody's going through depression. Come on, I'm going to pray for you tomorrow. This thing is over in Jesus' name. And guess what's going to happen? You pray for them. God will do it. Who are you? I thought we were just workmates. I thought you were just the girl who who sits next to me. Who are you? It's time to remove your card. (laughs) I didn't show you my other business card. I'm a servant of the Most High God. That's it. That's it, guys. That's it. So, Pastor Kara, if you could just pray, I want you to release a spirit of boldness, a spirit of uh, of, of a spirit of biazo, <laughs> a biazo spirit, a forceful spirit upon God's people. But also, just pray that God would remove any doubts, any fears right now, because many times fear keeps us from practicing God's word, isn't it? And just allow that God would compel His people. 
to do what he's asking them to do. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, we have come to you this morning. We have asked to be filled with your spirit. We have asked that your fire would fall upon us. And this morning we want to believe that you have heard our prayer. We want to believe that you have answered our prayer. And just like Peter in the boat, when he saw you walking on the lake, you told him to step out of the boat and to walk and to take courage. And Father, that is what you're asking us to do at this particular time, to step out of that boat and to take courage and to do the things that you're asking us to do. Jehovah, as even as we do this, we also thank you that in your word, you told your disciples uh, to wait, that they would be filled with your spirit, your spirit of boldness, your spirit of power, so that even as they went out into the world to preach the good news, they went with your power. Jehovah God, fill us with your power. Fill us, Jehovah God, this morning with your power, with boldness. Release your spirit of boldness among us. Release your spirit of power among us. Give us a, an instructed tongue so that as we speak, we will be speaking your word. Jehovah God, we are asking this morning that you would release indeed, in fact, even with the apostles, you confirmed your word in the fact that you, they were able to perform uh, miracles, signs, wonders, and miracles. And Jehovah God, that is what we are praying, is going to accompany us as we go out, signs, wonders, and miracles, so that you can confirm the word that we have been receiving all throughout these four days, so that you can confirm the word uh, today, even as we received your spirit earlier on when we asked for it. Father, we say we are ready. We are ready, Jehovah Lord. We are ready. And we want to pray even over uh, ourselves. I thank you, Lord, that um, even over this area, we want to pray over this area. And we just want to say, speak uh, Psalm 24 and say, lift up your heads. This is the eastern gates in this area. We say, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, yeah. that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord mighty in power. The Lord who is mighty in battle. He is the King of glory. And Father, we say, come in, Lord God. Come in, Lord Jesus. Come in, Lord Jesus. You who is powerful and you who is glorious. I'd like to just share um, a, a vision that came. And um, when, you know, as, as Pastor Maridi has been speaking, and it was just an amazing vision. And I saw a vision of a white horse and a rider. And um, I could not, at first I... I, I didn't know what that meant until I read it and I'd just like to read this for us so that we can understand that the king himself is here with us today. And this is what it says. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. The Lord is faithful and true today. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. And I believe that that is what God is going to do amongst us and has been doing amongst us today in making war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood and by the, by the name by which he's called the word of God. The word of God has, is here with us today. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule with the rod, with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The King is here. The King is here. Amen. The King is here. Amen. Our boldness and courage comes because the King of Kings in a white horse, the rider is here, Amen. ready for us to go into battle. Amen.